Earlier you said you create without being tied to the outcome. But of course, as a business owner, you want the outcome to be good. So Mm -hmm. in creating a product, do you think about, oh, this is what people will like? Or do you just create what you want? Like, how do you navigate that? Do you know what I mean? The artist and then the business side. Yes, yes, definitely both. It's very, very important for me to create things that I am excited about and that I want to personally use because that's when, you know, when you're excited about something, that's when you create with your heart and not so much with your mind. And, you know, on the other hand, I obviously have to be conscious of the market and what people want, what people expect. Yeah, it's been an interesting balance. I think it's just... It's just being selective about ideas and while also tuning into the heart because you also want to create things that are unique. (laughs) Like I don't want to make things that everyone makes because then, you know, why would, what's the difference, you know? Um, So for example, the Aphrodite journal, again, I come back to that idea because I think it's a pretty unique idea for, for a guided journal. I haven't seen anything like it. I knew that I needed it. And I also know, for example, in my own friend circle, my friends and myself, we need that connection with our feminine. You know, we're all boss girls and we kind of lose touch with that slow and sensual part of ourselves. Um, So I just kind of guessed that people (laughs) needed to. But then, of course, I get silly ideas that I probably are not, not that wouldn't be that popular so I just don't go ahead with them but honestly it's it's been pretty good so far it's been pretty good I've been hitting hitting the spot (laughs) how long does it take for you to create a journal like Aphrodite journal depends on the journal and depends how much you know how much writing I'm doing for the intro and everything and how much art I'm doing the Aphrodite journal I would say took me about five months I see. So do you like to work on like one project at a time or are you the type that has like a bunch of projects that you work on simultaneously? Yes. I try to do one at a time. Ah, okay. Yeah. Sometimes I have to, I have to kind of start something else, but I can't fully commit to two, <laughs> two projects at the same time. I'm a monogamous kind of girly. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I think it's more effective that way. It's it, just as a creative, I want to understand how other creatives work. Cause some people have like 10 billion ideas and they're trying to pursue them all at once. And some people just do one at a time. Yeah. yeah. I feel like if you're just working on one project, you are already on that kind of wavelength. You are in that frequency and it takes a lot of energy and time to get out of that frequency, to focus on an entirely different project. Yeah. So I feel like it's so much more productive and faster to just work on one thing while you're in that wavelength instead of constantly switching and wasting that time and energy. Yeah. What about like managing like your social media and everything outside of creating project products though? Is that difficult for you then to switch? Yes and no. I feel like because I've done this for such a long time, it is just like a natural part of my practice. And I've separated myself personally from it enough to not be too attached to, you know, the engagement rate and all of that. And I actually treat my social media or Instagram at least as kind of fast food art while I'm working on my slow cooked art. So the reels that I post on my, yeah, yeah. So the reels that I post on my Instagram, I still love doing them. It's super fun. It's quick, but it's fast food. You know, people see it and they forget about it the next day. But I kind of use it to keep the momentum going while I work on my slow cooked food, which are actually my, you know, my journals, my card decks, my diaries. That is the slow cooked, (laughs) slow cooked. And Uh, yeah, no, I like that. I like, I like that framework. Okay. Let's talk about art as a healing tool because Clearly, you like to use art for healing and self-exploration. I guess, what advice do you have for people to start using art in this way? Yes, definitely. I think it's important to know that you don't need to be an artist to use art for healing. Like, I feel like so many people kind of completely close themselves off from this beautiful form of therapy. It can be therapy if you if you want it to be, 
um, because they think, oh, I'm not good at art. I've, you know, maybe I made some art when I was little and my mom told me it's ugly, (laughs) you know, but it really doesn't have to be this way for, it can be healing simply to even use one color and paint the entire page in just that one color. It can even be healing to paint like a child. Paint like a child to connect with your inner child and who cares if it looks ugly, right? When I was in Europe a couple of months ago, I hosted some really beautiful workshops in a few cities and a part of the workshops was using art as a tool for healing and manifestation as well. So I would guide people through a visualization meditation through their mind, garden, heart cave and soul and then after we would do journaling session and people would draw what they saw in their visualizations to kind of have this physical thing to take away with them to remember the experience and then we also used art again for this manifestation exercise where I got people to imagine their desire in an abstract form so like what would your desire look like if it was a shape if it was a color if it was a texture, like, is it moving? Is it still? Is it spiky? Is it soft? So I got them to visualize that. And then we put that abstract visualization on paper. So that was also really, really powerful. Um, maybe not so much for healing, but for manifestation. Yeah. 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 Let's, let's talk more about manifestation since it seems like a big part of your life. We've talked about manifestation many times. So like, don't do basics. Give us like a little bit more advanced, (laughs) advanced tips or practices that you do for manifesting. I don't know if there are actual specific practices that I do. It just happens a lot of the time. I guess what I shared before, that's, that's definitely a practice that I do. Three words. Yeah, journaling as if it has already happened and trying to bring up those feelings, like really feel those feelings as if it has already happened because I feel like that helps you to get into that vibration of your desire already, you know, being alive, being in this world and that's how you bring it to life. But a lot of my manifestations recently have felt like such just coincidences. Oh, actually, I remembered, I had this revelation the other day that the bigger your dream is, the bigger your, what you want to manifest is, the more people you have to get involved because we manifest through people, right? The more you share your idea with others, the more likely it's going to reach someone who can really help you. And someone can be like, oh, "Oh, yeah, I know this person who can really assist with this. Or, oh, I have this thing and you can come here and do this. And it's, you know, you have to, you definitely have to put yourself out there. At the workshops that I did, it was super effortless for me to organize because I shared about it so much with people, with friends when I was traveling, even not knowing if it's going to happen or not before I even organized anything. I would just talk about it all the time. And I kept meeting people who would say, oh, I would love to come and do music for this event. Or I own a yoga studio. Oh, that's you so can come cool. to my studio. It just like fell into place with the right people. Exactly. So we manifest through people it's really hard like to manifest anything if you are just on your own by yourself in your room so you have to get out there and talk to people 